thank you everyone who was able to join us on time and I'm going to be very brief. I cannot thank everybody enough for participating, all the panelists for participating and for all of you for joining us. I'm Nina Altschiller, I'm the president of the League of Women Voters of Coastal Georgia and we live on the coast and this, this topic matters so much to every one of us. Uh, so thank you for joining us for this important discussion. This meeting is being recorded and it will be posted tomorrow afternoon at the very latest on Saturday, depending on so you can have somebody's this. dental appointment. Um, so please tell your friends who couldn't be here with us uh, that they should tune in. This is really probably one of the most important conversations we can have as we live on the coast. Um, tonight's panel is being moderated by Mary Landers. She covers the environment for Georgia, uh, Coastal Georgia's inclusive nonprofit, nonpartisan news organization, The Current. <clears throat> um, and Mary previously spent and Mary previously spent 24 years as a reporter for the Savannah Morning News. She has said that she's a skeptical optimist, eager to explore further the big challenges facing coastal Georgia, including global warming and the accompanying sea level rise and that she's even more interested in sharing solutions to these problems. So clearly Mary is the perfect person to moderate our discussion this evening. She will introduce the panelists in order of their presentations and will note that each will have an allotted time to speak and that their questions should, and that your, their questions, your questions should be held until the end of the presentation when we'll have a question and answer session. And you can put your questions in the chat section on Zoom. And Mary, I am going to take this time to turn it over to you. And thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Nina. And thank you to the League for inviting me to moderate this panel. I know most of the panelists uh, well, and I, I know all of them by name. Um, some of us go back uh, several decades um, in, in knowing each other and th these people have been great sources over the years, keeping the, the coast informed about what's going on. Um, as Nina mentioned, we'll have 10 minutes for each panelist and um, please write down your questions in the chat as they occur to you. I think that's probably the best way to keep track of, of what um, maybe you want explored further. Um, so uh, without further ado, we have Dr. Clark Alexander. Um, Clark is the director and professor of the UGA Skidaway Institute of, In of Oceanography. He's going to present the scientific view and the data relating to rates and processes of shoreline change and the human impact on the coast. Uh, I'll be talking about some of those things and I'll be happy to answer questions about uh, all of those things, but I, I'm not gonna try to cover them in my comments here right now. What I, what I wanna focus on uh, in, in my 10 minutes here is um, what I, something that I think is very important. Um, oh, let me share my screen here so we can get right. started. Here's, here's, here's my uh, bottom line up front for everybody listening tonight is that you know, mostly I'm going to talk about sea level rise because that is one of the issues that is directly impacting us right now, something that is high on everybody's mind. And um, this is my bottom line that there's a lot of data out there that's accessible to everybody. I'm going to tell you where you can uh, look at it yourselves to evaluate the data yourselves. And I recommend that, uh, that you follow the data and that you follow those that follow the data as well. So there's, there's my, uh, my pitch for, for the uh, League of Women Voters kind of uh, presentation. Now, climate change and sea level rise is not uh, an issue that is being taken um, lightly, uh, globally or nationally. On the left-hand side of this panel, you can see that there are reports that are done by international organizations, the most prominent of which is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. They just released their sixth report, and the 
uh, web address to access that report is on the slide here. And um, so you, you'll be able to go back and get these links off of the, uh, the recorded talk later on. Um, and also, the United States has been issuing climate assessments. Uh, the fourth one was issued uh, uh, and released on Black Friday uh, by the Trump administration. And uh, the, the new fifth assessment is right now open for public comment. And this is a document that's created with input from basically every federal agency that exists in our government today. So there are contributions from everyone from Department of Agriculture, Department of Defense. And I wanna highlight the Department of Defense sees climate change and sea level rise as a national security threat. So again, these are issues that are not being taken lightly. Further, I just wanna point out that the Nobel Prize Committee just recently awarded their, their Nobel Prize in physics this, for this year to uh, three gentlemen that worked on issues of how to model complex systems and also how to model Earth's climate. So there's a recognition that, that these are the defining kinds of, of science and research that's going on right now. Now, as a ge geologist, I kind of got to take a step back and say that, yes, sea level has been changing. Uh, here I, you have a graph uh, on the top panel showing the last 5 million years. And you can see that sea level was much higher in the past 5 million years ago. And only within the last uh, million years or so have we had these large scale fluctuations associated with sea level rise and fall. If you look at the bottom panel, we're looking at the last 500,000 years. And we're over here on the right hand side, we're looking at the present day. And you can see that sea level has been as high as it is now a number of times in the past. Those are on cycles of about 125,000 years. So uh, we have seen sea levels like we're seeing today uh, in the past. And we have seen lows in sea level, which the last time it was very low was 20,000 years ago. We see evidence for those changes in sea level here on the Georgia coast. If you look on the right-hand panel of this slide, you can see that there are multiple linear pa colored panels and those represent old barrier islands that were formed when sea level was higher than it is today. Now, the one thing that is different in, in the geologic records that we have, here we're looking at the last 800,000 years of carbon dioxide from ice cores in Greenland. Um, in those ice cores, there are small bubbles that are trapped in the ice. Each of those bubbles contains CO2 levels that was in the atmosphere back in time. And so we can see a pattern that mimics that of um, the glacial to interglacial cycles mimic that high sea level that we saw and then the low sea levels that we saw earlier. The one big difference is that uh, CO2 levels should be somewhere up here under a natural system, but our CO2 concentrations are up here in the upper right corner of this graph now. And so, the, and we've been measuring the CO2 levels in, at Mauna Loa for the last uh, 60 years. And you can see that it's gone up continuously. So you can see that there is something different about this time period than there has been uh, in the past. And that is obviously the impact of man and their contributions to the uh, CO2 and other greenhouse ga gases in the atmosphere. We also have satellites that now circle the earth that are um, measuring the distance between the satellite's orbit and the, and the surface of the oceans. And as you can see from this graph, they've been doing this since 1993 with multiple different satellites overlapping their uh, data collection. You can see that the curve is upward trend of about three millimeters per year. And that's away from the land. So we, we're not being involved with um, uh, uh, interactions having to do with human impacts uh, like water withdrawal or or um, natural things like uh, plate tectonic effects. So that's a, a global measure. 
what do we see when we look around the edges of the continents? We, in lower latitudes, we see that typically we have rising sea levels all around the east and the west coast of the United States, somewhere on the order of three to six inches, uh, I'm sorry, millimeters per year. In areas like the Gulf Coast, where we have a lot of sediment coming out of rivers like the Mississippi River, and those sediments are compacting very, very rapidly and the land is subsiding, we have higher rates of sea level rise because the sea level is going up in the oceans all over. And what's happening at the coast can either mean that you add uh, your land sinking to how fast the water is rising, or you have the opposite effect, like up here in high latitudes, where the land has been um, under glacial ice and, and the crust has been pushed down into the mantle. And the, actually in those areas where you see sea levels falling now, you have the land rising up after the ice has melted and sea level is slower than the land is rising. And so it actually looks like a relative fall in sea level at the locations where we're measuring sea level rise. Mark, I need to interrupt you for a moment and sure. ask that everyone mute themselves. Um, if you're not the speaker, we're getting some feedback and it's, it's hard to hear Clark at times. Um, and also Clark, you have two minutes left. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I like listening to myself, but um, not echoing back to the, the things. Two minutes left. So here's uh, what we see here at, at Fort Pulaski. This is the data that is most critical to us here in Georgia. Fort Pulaski, 1935 record, uh, started collecting uh, sea level information. It's a continuous record up to 2022. It's con co collecting data now. And you can see that sea level is rising at a similar rate of what they measure with the satellites, about three millimeters per year, or a little over a foot per century. Now that's projected to rise in the future. Um, and the current estimates of what that rise will be by the end of the century are somewhere between two and three feet. That's where the modeling is suggesting we're going. But um, in some more uh, less likely scenarios, the amount of sea level rise might be more like six or seven feet. Uh, depending on how global ice sheets uh, respond, which we don't really understand yet. There's a number of different impacts from sea level rise. I just want to mention a few because this is where sea level rise impacts the built and human environment. You know, that's where we have docks and we've got uh, small islands and as sea level rises, you get salt water intruding into those areas. As sea level rises, a natural marsh wants to migrate onto the upland, but when we build barriers, we end up with something called coastal squeeze, which I think someone will probably talk about here, where you lose marsh. Uh, and then, of course, in septic systems, which are very common in coastal Georgia, as sea, as sea level rises, the groundwater rises. And so this distance for treatment of the septic effluent uh, decreases, making septic systems less efficient. There are a couple tools that you can use to visualize uh, hazards of sea level rise, coastal change, uh, sediment erosion. Uh, the Georgia Coastal Hazards Portal is one of those. The address is right here. It has a lot of uh, uh, good information for coastal Georgia. And then lastly, I'd recommend the uh, NOAA Digital Coast website, uh, which let, allows you to simulate in one foot increment sea level rise, and you can see what areas of the coast will be flooded with different amounts of sea level rise. So if you want to assume the lower estimate will occur, great, you can look at one foot of sea level rise. If you want to assume the six foot will arise, then you can do something like this. Here's using that site for Tybee Island. Here's the current conditions of the areas that are flooded at at um, mean higher high water, uh, every hi highest high tide are shown here. Here's with three feet of sea level rise. Here's with six feet of sea level rise. And so depending on what happens in the near term over the before the end of the century, there are going to be significant impacts to the built environment. And so we need to be thinking about getting people into office, in my opinion, that look at the data, think about the data, and are deliberate in trying to lead where the data points us to go. 
Thank you. Thanks, Clark. Uh, next up, we have Kathy Sackis. Kathy is a coastal naturalist and co-founder of the Ocean Exchange. She's president of the Tybee Island Marine Science Foundation. Uh, Kathy also spent a long time um, working at Gray's Reef, uh, doing education there, and is the founder of the Gray's Reef Foundation. Um, she will provide an overview of how climate is affecting our coast and how people are um, stepping up with solutions uh, to address global ocean and coastal issues. Kathy, it's all yours. Okay, well, thank you very much. I, uh, Clark, that was great. I look forward to seeing everybody else's presentations too. Uh, let's see, share. Okay. Okay. Okay, I've started my timer. <laughs> so I can, there we go. Okay, well, um, really thank the League of Women Voters for putting on this, this uh, panel discussion. This is uh, a topic that should be, should be foremost in everybody's mind. And um, I'm glad I went after Clark because everything that has to do with what I'm going to talk about is all based on science. And it's, uh, it's, uh, these are all part of climate change. They all feed in together, but it, it's uh, really important for us to understand how the connections work. I don't know that I'll make uh, a whole lot of cases, but because there's 10 minutes is not a whole lot of time, but that's okay. Um, and uh, to follow up on some of what Clark was saying about sea level rise, the image on the left of your screen is, is the causeway. That's the Tybee Causeway uh, during Irma. And uh, everything was underwater. <laughs> um, I have a house on Tybee and, and I'm really happy to see the NOAA predictions uh, because at six feet, I'm still okay. I must be on a dune line. Not that I'm going to hold on to that property for long. When I bought it, I knew that it was hurricane fodder in the first place. So that's why we have a house out in the country. But you can see after hurricanes, how, um, how damaging they can be. I know Hermina is gonna touch on plastics, uh, but really to understand part of what we need to be doing in terms of all of those issues with uh, associated with climate change, we really need to be, be paying attention to what we're doing as far as um, uh, you know, putting, putting substance, putting uh, plastics, uh, not tending to, to what we use. Um, I can't tell you how heartbreaking it is when you see a dolphin or a right whale or a loggerhead sea turtle entangled. It's just really wrong. Uh, in looking at what I needed to do as an individual, to clean up my act, um, I, I had to even stop using fingernail polish uh, just because of the little microplastics in it. Uh, one of the things that really is heartbreaking right now is the uh, manatee die-off that is a cause of runoff from uh, fertilizers, herbicides, pesticides on people's manicured lawns. It's caused eutrophication in the waterways uh, choking the grass. Another consequent of, consequence of plastics are leaching of the, of the bisphenols and the phthalates that interrupt the endocrine system of endangered species. It, it interrupts all of, our, uh, all of our endocrine systems, but it's particularly critical in endangered species. We have no more uh, Florida panthers left. Uh, they can't reproduce, so we had to bring in Texas, um, Texas uh, panthers to uh, in, uh, interbreed with the Florida panthers. Uh, so in looking at what we can do to, um, to mitigate uh, all the bad stuff that we're doing to the environment, these are just a few examples of organizations that are really turning the tide. They're really uh, looking at the issues and making a difference. Waste to Worth is uh, pretty, pretty fabulous. Um, biofilms has become a big industry and uh, you know it's it's uh, uh, right on down I, I had to to go and, and order online some biofilm which is really lovely when you when you know you're doing the right thing and some of these um, 
some of these innovations were presented at uh, um, Ocean Exchange. You know, Ocean Exchange is uh, is an organization that uh, that promotes and accelerates uh, new ideas that are helping the planet. Uh, I really like this one made from shrimp uh, plastics made from shrimp shells. Uh, even six pack rings are are um, getting an uh, an updo in. Uh, so that we don't have to keep putting plastics back into the environment. One of the things that uh, I worked on while I was uh, the chair of the Tybee Island Marine Beach Task Force, Tybee Island Beach Task Force, was we were looking at dunes, sand dunes. And um, one of the, the uh, awful things that we see on Tybee is back in the 50s and the 60s, uh, the city of Tybee cut through the dunes to allow emergency vehicle access onto the beach. Well, if you've ever seen the um, um, video footage from Hurricane Matthew in particular, uh, all of those gaps, there are two of them, three of them, just, just look like whitewater, a whitewater river passing through those dune systems. So one of the things that I was involved in was uh, filling that gap in with a 165 foot sandbag, yep. Uh, it took uh, three days to fill that thing up and then two days to cover it up. The other thing that we did was start to, was putting in um, sand fences and the sand fences, uh, we have a new configuration that we had to get uh, permission from DNR to put in because it was something that hadn't been done before, but I'm here to tell you that uh, it works beautifully and uh, um, this was what it looked like when they were first put in, but the sand on the sand fences are now halfway up the sand fences. So we had to put, uh, oops, wrong way. We had to put um, uh, marsh, marsh rack on the, uh, the bottoms of those fences and that really tremendously helped trap the sand. Another thing that we really need to pay attention to are how, how climate change infects uh, uh, affects the Gullah Geechee people and the indigenous people. The indigenous people, uh, the Timucua, the Wali, the Creek, and the Yamasee, the Timucua and the Wali are not, not with us anymore, and the Creek and the Yamasee are pretty, pretty much reduced. But, you know, looking at how they handled, um, handled being on the coast during, during the winter months, and then they would go into the inland interior during, during the summer months, probably makes a whole lot of sense, uh, especially with the advent of hurricanes. The Gullah Geechee people uh, are native islanders that have uh, um, worked off the land, lived off the land, and you know their communities are in peril too. Probably all around the world, the, the socioeconomic impact is greater on, on those communities that are, don't have the resources to combat that. One of the things I think we should be pushing for, we are not a C40 city yet, but there are, I think there are 79 around the world. And this is, a, this is an organization set up by mayors that, uh, that um, promise to make their cities um, sustainable in the future. So this is something that we could push for with Savannah. One of the other things that people can do is uh, figure out what their carbon footprint is. And just by going to different, different uh, websites, you can do that. I think one of the really good ones is the Conservation International. Uh, Oceana, sorry, I, for me, I didn't put Oceana on there, but uh, that one too. Um, so all of these organizations, all of these websites can help you figure out what your carbon footprint is. For me, I had to look at what my lifestyle was before I can start telling other people what they might think of doing, but literally going green means eating more vegetables, less meat. If you do eat seafood, make sure that it's locally sourced. And greening your house, you know, limiting the water, this is all common sense. But one of the things that I did much to my neighbor's horror, especially on Tybee out here in the country, they don't care, but on Tybee um, where we have a house, um, I killed my lawn. I just refused to rake my pine needles. And so now I have a natural lawn 
And the good news is I don't have to hire a landskeeper or a person to mow the lawn. It's really easy to do and just use native plants. Of course, uh, power use is always uh, reducing your power use. These are, again, really common sense, um, common sense things to do. Oh, I'm all down to my last two slides. Um, and so this is, uh, I'm happy to share this, this uh, slideshow with anybody who wants it. But uh, this is just a list of what I think people should be doing. And if you look down on the lower right-hand side, you'll see where the Women, Women League of Voters comes in. And that is electing advocates that mitigate climate change. That's so key. If we don't have a multi-pronged approach, and it starts with our, with our legislators, it begin, well, it begins locally with us. We have to make the change, but we also have to speak up. We have to make our voices known, and we have to certainly put people in office that, uh, that reflect those. Um, sorry, I'm, oh, I see. <laughs> I was wondering what was beeping at me. It's my phone telling me I'm up. My time is up. Sorry. <laughs> um, anyway, so uh, so good kudos to the League of Women Voters for um, for in encouraging us to elect officials that uh, that mitigate climate change. And uh, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge all the pretty pictures. And most of them are mine, but they do come on. Some of them came off the internet and from various sources. So thank you all very much. I really appreciate uh, taking uh, that you all are here and that you allowed me to speak to you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kathy. Uh, you're a good self-regulator there with the timing. Um, <laughs> we have next up Robert Parady. Um, he is a retired Exxon executive and what he calls an accidental environmentalist. Um, he began volunteering with Oceana um, to uh, forestall the launching of a proposed uh, uh, seismic testing, exploring for oil off the Georgia and the entire East Coast, really. So he has since uh, become a frequent uh, letter to the editor writer on this subject. Uh, lots of his letters have appeared in the Savannah Morning News. And uh, through that, he got in direct touch with um, Oceana. So um, he's also written a book, uh, The American Legacy of an Italian Motorcyclist, uh, in which he describes his early childhood, his career with Exxon, and how he reinvented himself as an environmentalist opposing the oil lobby's ongoing and destructive exploration and production plans for the U.S. Eastern Seaboard. Um, Robert, it's all yours. Thank you very much. I uh, appreciate the invitation here. You. here but I started with the uh, uh, using the worst uh, a case of uh, ineptitude and flagrant engineering mistakes and deliberate uh, shortcuts that the uh, people and the organizations involved with the, the, the British Petroleum blowout of 11 years ago. And uh, I've got some pretty disturbing uh, view graphs in full color of, of what happened up, up to and, and during that, that uh, crisis. And the, the shameful part of that all was that the, uh, the Department of Justice had finally litigated all, all the lawsuits brought against the principles, the principles being British Petroleum, Transocean Corporation, and Halliburton. Uh, the amount of that uh, fine uh, was fine, finally litigated in uh, about uh, 10 years ago came to 66 billion with a B dollars uh, of which 44 billion was attributed to uh, uh, British Petroleum it, itself uh, in uh, the remainder to the, a company called Transocean uh, Corporation and then finally Halliburton. And interestingly enough, the uh, the thing that caught my eye was the, the failure of a blowout preventer. A blowout preventer is no such thing, and you cannot rely on them. They're overblown. They're, 
uh, the one on my blog on a repair uh, rig in Lake Maracaibo because I worked down there for 12 years uh, with an outfit called Creole Petroleum Corporation, which was uh, uh, one of the original foreign investments of uh, Standard Oil of New Jersey, which you know since that time has become uh, Exxon uh, uh, Mobil. Uh, but the fact is that uh, the, the, the litigants of that uh, amazing fine, which was uh, based on the proven uh, uh, environment uh, mistakes that the drilling crew made, um, some of them intentional, some of them uh, accidental, but it all led to that, that gross fine and the instant death of 11 uh, uh, working uh, people, no, uh, all men, on on the floor of that rig that just uh, they ignored a, 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 a symptom called a kick, which occurred about five miles, six miles down below the rig, uh, causing uh, the blowout. Because if, if, if a blowout preventer doesn't close practically instantaneously and you start thinking about it it's too late and so those 11 people were uh, cremated alive essentially and uh, you know they they were just uh, you know guys that had been working out on a rig for uh, four four months at a time and then taking a month month off and going back to their families but the fact is that that was declared the work by the court by the court uh, the worst industrial accident in the history of American industry and caused by uh, deliberate malfeasance and uh, ignorance of certain things that were in the drilling program that they ignored. Uh, but the fact is those companies, uh, particularly uh, British Petroleum and Transocean, the following year, of that of of the uh, not the blot itself, but about two years after the blot, when this uh, litigation was was completed by the Department of Justice, with the fine that I had mentioned, British Petroleum and Transocean were back in the Gulf of Mexico, eleven rigs identical to the Macondo one, which was lying on the floor of the ocean in five thousand over five thousand feet of water because that's where the wellhead rested and that's where the blowout preventer rested, which bore no resemblance whatsoever to the little blowout that I had on my workover rig on, on Lake Maracaibo, which I, I spent okay. seven years I'll out there working there okay. on the lake, uh, 4,000 wells. We could outproduce Saudi Aramco at the time we could produce, if called upon, 4 million barrels a day of crude of, of four or five different segregations. Uh, but the point of my comment there was, was, was to, to illustrate uh, what has happened to you, what used to be a critical piece of equipment and the automation and, and uh, artificial intelligence has, was rel relied upon uh, to the to the expense of death by those eleven people, in that well flowing for freely, freely. You know, the good news is was that they discovered oil. Thank you, Robert. I'm, I'm sure we'll have uh, some questions for you when we get to the the questions at the end. Um, next up, we have Hermina Glass Hill. Uh, Hermina is Oceana's Georgia field representative. Oops, sorry. Um, Prior to joining Oceana, she served as the research historian for the National Center for Civil and Human Rights, where she learned the value of hard-won hard -won struggles for racial equality and ocean justice during the civil rights movement. She's the founder of the Susie King Taylor Women's Institute and Ecology Center to honor the Gullah Geechee freedom seeker, that's <clears throat> Susie King Taylor, and provide educational programming on the influencing of coastal ecology in the lives of enslaved and free women. At Oceana, she's focusing on the impact of plastics pollution, which has a direct and deadly effect on wildlife with thousands of seabirds, sea turtles, and marine mammals killed each year after ingesting plastic 
or getting entangled in it. I, I think she'll probably share with you how you and I are um, eating plastic now as well. Uh, Amina? Thank you so much, Mary, for that introduction. And thank you to the League of Women Voters of Coastal Georgia for this invitation to uh, share um, how plastic is related to climate change. But I think I'll go off script and I'll, I'll begin to, uh, I'll share um, an, uh, my unscripted uh, uh, talk. And that is um, this idea of climate justice. Uh, as you can see, what we are doing today is we're building on one another's presentations. And I'd like to uh, begin to talk off uh, record from my Oceana work is that the life cycle of plastics um, generated from uh, fossil fuel production is um, something that is uh, not only just warming our, our world and changing the climate, but I'm really concerned about uh, the most vulnerable populations among us throughout the world, and including uh, those marginalized people, indigenous people, as Kathy spoke about, um, Black, indigenous, and people of color who are greatly impacted by climate change. Let's be clear from uh, Clark's presentation, climate change is not coming. It's not on its way. Climate change is here. Climate change is impacting every human that is alive. And for the most vulnerable among us, climate change certainly hit the, hits the hardest. Um, these populations are uh, experiencing climate change in, um, uh, in the most dynamic ways. Uh, uh, climate change impacts public health. Uh, as we can see from the COVID virus, uh, climate change is exacerbating respiratory illnesses, which are disproportionately um, uh, uh, suffered by uh, people of color. And the heat islands in large cities like uh, Atlanta and Savannah and Macon, these heat islands are impacting all these vulnerable populations because it's too hot. There's a rap song that's called, it's getting hot in here. So take off all your clothes. It's hot. It's getting hot. It is hot. I, as I speak to Gullah Geechee communities, um, I, I try to bring this conversation into just regular everyday people speak. And that is, how do you experience climate change? And um, it's not all of that highfalutin stuff that you know uh, folks with degrees have, but it is how you measure uh, ch climate change in your lived experiences. And so I may talk to Gullah Geechee natives who may uh, offer stories that include that, you know, it's hotter this year than it has been in the last 10 years. And I remember growing up in the 70s and the 80s, it was never this hot. And the fish were jumping and the cotton was high and the, uh, the marsh grass was growing and there were ample resources uh, to consume as food as well as uh, for cultural resources like uh, sweet grass baskets and um, rabbit tobacco, rabbit foot tobacco for medicinal purposes. So we see that climate change is impacting the lived cultural experiences of everybody, but most certainly these populations of people like the Gullah Geechee people and indigenous communities who rely on these natural resources and have for thousands of years in regard to native people, as well as the Gullah Geechee people who have been here for 400 years and can trace their heritage um, back to Africa uh, and, and certainly retaining these Africanisms. 
But now on to my um, Oceana uh, presentation, and I will just whiz through that because essentially everyone has um, already iterated some part of that. So, um, oh, one moment. Can you all see this? Okay, here we go. So I'll just whiz through this. Uh, um, so Oceana is the largest global nonprofit organization solely dedicated to protecting our oceans. We're in 30 countries and we are really concerned about the threats to our oceans. Those threats being plastic pollution, offshore drilling and seismic testing, as well as threats to fisheries, sharks, and whales in our oceans. And our mission is very simple. Save the ocean, feed the world. That's what it's all about, right? Uh, we achieve these goals by uh, identifying key decision makers and then leveraging the science, as has been stated already, law, grassroots engagement, advocacy and strategic strategic communications to win victories for our oceans. So we've already identified the problem, but what is the problem? Global companies are producing uh, 400 million tons of plastics each year, and that's a problem. Plastic trash on the streets washes into the storm drains that empties into the ocean. Wind and rain can transport plastic waste from landfills to streams and rivers. And uh, this can fall off of transportation trucks and end up in our sewer system. Uh, as Kathy and others have stated, it impacts the lives uh, of our marine animals, including our wonderful, cute little sea turtles, manatees, sea seals, and sea lions, baleen, and tooth whales. But you know, they're getting choked and strangled and drowned because of plastic. 80% of uh, the animals li are listed on the endangered or are, are either listed on the endangered species list under the Endangered Species Act. As of late, newspaper headings are touting microplastics have been found in human foods for the first time. We're worried about that and we very well should be. The Atlanta Journal Constitution two years ago says, how can, we, how can we get plastic waste under control? And new studies are showing that plastic is ending up in seafood. So what's driving this problem? Producing plastic products generates an enormous amount of greenhouse gas emissions. As we can see from uh, this present, this graph, uh, starting in 2019, the life cycle of plastic, uh, 189 coal plants will produce 0.86 gigatons of emissions. Uh, by 2050, there will be 615 gigatons, 615 coal plants producing 2.8 gigatons of carbon emissions in our atmosphere. The US is responsible for some of the highest plastic inputs to the ocean in the world. We rank third. The US also generates more plastic waste than any other country in the world. And sadly, we are number one. 36% of uh, the plastic that we see is from plastic packaging. Single-use materials designed for immediate disposal is the culprit and a really big problem. Recycling only solves 2% of the problem. Uh, and recycling does not keep pace with plastic production. We are drowning in plastic. So one minute. Okay. <clears throat> Plastic is made to last forever. And I will defer to Kathy's presentation. Uh, she had some of the suggestions that I was going to share 
Thank you for your time and thank you for listening. Next, we have Ashby Nix Worley. She serves as the Coastal Climate Adaptation Director for the Georgia Nature Conservancy. Um, Ashby brings nature-based solutions to help address coastal hazards to build a more resilient Georgia coast. Um, these are some very um, practical and top of mind issues. Um, she's worked for over 10 years as a coastal scientist in the Georgia region, um, collaborating with the DNR and the University of Georgia in conducting ecological research, oyster restoration, water quality monitoring, and marsh studies. Uh, or yeah, she was uh, the Satilla Riverkeeper as well. Uh, so Ashby, it's all yours. Yeah. Thank you, Mary. Hopefully you can hear me okay. I'm going to stay off video to reserve the little bit of bandwidth <laughs> that I have right now. I keep flipping out tonight. Um, thank you again for having me. I'm Ashby Nix Worley, and thanks, Mary, for introducing. Um, tonight, uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about adapting to a changing climate here on Georgia's coast. Can y'all see my screen okay? Okay, good. Um, so if you're not familiar with the Nature Conservancy, um, TNC was founded in the United States in 1951, but now we work across 72 countries and six continents across the world. We have more than a million members and more than 400 scientists on our team, and we're considered the largest uh, environmental nonprofit. Um, our mission is to protect the lands and waters on which all life depends, and that's what all our work is formed around. Um, and here in Georgia, the Nature Conservancy started in the 60s with the preservation of Egg and Wolf Island um, at the mouth of the Altamaha River. So TNC incorporates climate into everything we do, from our land conservation efforts to freshwater and fisheries work. And we have increasingly prioritized tackling climate as a main pillar and focus of our work with the following strategies that work here in Georgia. And the last one, commu helping communities adapt to climate change is what I'm digging into today. So as you've likely seen in your own community or in your own backyards, and uh, Clark certainly laid this out um, well in the first presentation, the impacts of climate are being experienced in a variety of ways across our state today. In particular, for our coastal areas, we are seeing this change in the form of increased coastal flooding from both the intensity of the NAM storms, which brings significant rainfall and storm surge to our coast, but as well as that encroaching sea level rise along our low-lying coastal areas. At the same time, our coastal counties in the South Atlantic continue to show a rapid rate of population increase. And so it's really this increase in coastal hazards plus an increase in population and development in our coastal area that creates an increased vulnerability to both the human and the natural systems here in Georgia. So of course, all of these coastal hazards have social and economic impacts. Um, about 16% of the immediate US coastline is classified as high hazard areas and home to 1.3 million people and $300 billion in residential property. Sea level rise will continue to increase the amount of these highly vulnerable people and property by 30 to 60 percent by 2100. And NOAA predicts, as Clark had mentioned, our state um, could see between nine inches and three feet of sea level rise as soon as 2050, which is about the lifetime of a mortgage at this point. And anywhere between 60 and 160,000 coastal Georgians could be affected by sea level rise by 2100. Most of these are going to be in the Brunswick and Savannah areas where there are large urban populations. And unfortunately, these are often some of the areas with the most vulnerable populations with less resources to adapt and respond. So the good news is that nature can be part of that solution for these communities to adapt and mitigate to those impacts of climate change on the coast. Healthy, intact co coastal ecosystems such as our coastal marshes, oyster reefs, barrier islands, beaches, and dune systems that Kathy showed help to reduce that impact of storm surge on the coast by dissipating wave action and absorbing those floodwaters and protecting that nearby community. Coastal wetlands are found to have prevented up to $625 million in flood damages to private property during Hurricane Sandy in the Northeast. And a large portion of our U.S. coastline is protected by this natural infrastructure. And if it was lost, would significantly increase the number of vulnerable people to coastal hazards. So really by ensuring that um, 
By ensuring that this natural infrastructure remains healthy and intact in the future, we can maintain the risk reduction benefits and all the other wonderful co-benefits and services they provide us um, into the future for our coast. So this diagram or this um, infographic really shows you that the science is starting to show us also that the, these natural systems are um, are cost benefit to us in terms of saving money for our coast and reducing those impacts of a, of flooding and storm surge, um, things like coral reefs and mangroves, our marsh systems, oyster reefs, and others certainly um, starting to be able to put dollar dollar figures and values on what they're protecting and the risk reduction services that they're providing. So there are numerous entities, including all of those on the panel tonight, um, that are working to tackle climate change and are involved with um, climate here on Georgia's coast, and particularly for the Savannah area groups like um, Marine Extension Service, 100 Miles, DNR, Georgia Tech, a lot of different partners playing in this space, and which is really great to see, and there's some great work happening. Tonight, I'm just specifically going to highlight a few of those efforts that TSC is working on with our, um, with our partners along the Georgia coast. We're working hand in hand with communities like Camden and Glen County to create and use online decision support tools that bring in flood science data and unique analyses to help inform today's decisions on land use, planning, and conservation. We facilitate on the ground nature-based projects such as living shorelines and preserved open space to reduce erosion and allow that natural migration of habitats and protect critical flood prone areas from development. We work to pilot innovative techniques for resilience building using sediment from dredging projects that are already planned and occurring that can then help our marshes keep up with the impacts of sea level rise. And we also work with communities on resiliency planning and policies, focusing on the benefits that nature can provide to risk reduction. Lastly, uh, we help uh, further the science on climate adaptation in the Southeast that helps lead to more data and decision-making, more data for decision-making unique partnerships and creative funding solutions for climate action. So one of these, I'm just highlighting a few of these examples here. Um, recently, we worked with Camden County and the city of St. Mary's on creating a Rise Ready Coastal Resiliency tool. The community wanted and needed tools to help them with flood risk awareness and outreach to the public about the various types of not only current flooding, but future flooding that they could see in their community, such as sea level rise. And, and information beyond the FEMA flood maps that talk about flooding. Um, they, like Savannah, uh, had plenty of flooding during the last two hurricanes. They also needed a way to look at various flooding scenarios with their community data, such as zoning, parcel information, land use information, to help them make those policy and future land use decisions that would make them more resilient. Lastly, the community was interested in ways that they could help identify and prioritize and preserve those open space areas in the floodplain that could help build their resiliency to flooding and also help with them with their FEMA CRS scores, which ultimately helps them reduce flood insurance in their community. So these are the three tools that we created hand in hand with Camden County and the city of St. Mary's, and that's a flood risk awareness tool, the community planning tool, and the CRS open space explorer tool. You can see all of these tools on their floodplain management uh, websites, as well as TNC website and they're being used today for decision making and we're hoping to roll these out um, in the very near future actually this year for Glen County and Brunswick um, and also extending it to the city of Kingsland in Camden County. Another project that we were able to be involved with as a partner is the beneficial use of sediment um, at a project on Jekyll Island called the Thin Layer Placement Pilot Project at Jekyll Creek. Um, in the upper left corner, you'll see a section of the intercoastal waterway, which is um, the smallest or the, the, excuse me, the shallowest section of the intercoastal waterway, certainly in Georgia, but maybe in the Southeast. And it created navigational hazards for, um, for passerby boats. So that's a picture at low tide. So there's been a longstanding interest in, um, in with the Army Corps of Engineers and boaters, the boating community to um, dredge that section, to widen it so that it would, was passable by boats. But what's important is that that sediment that's that's in that area is also important for the marshes to keep up with sea level rise. So sediment can be a limiting factor because of dams and, and dredging projects that take it out of our natural system. 
And this beneficial use of sediment pilot project was able to capture some of that sediment, place it on top of the marsh, some area of marsh, a five acre section of marsh on Jekyll Island, and uh, use it as a way to test this technique of thin layer placement here in Georgia with our big tides. Basically it sprays a, a thin layer of sediment across the area, which helps then uh, marshes potentially keep up with sea level rise and not drown, which is a um, concern, particularly in the Northeast. Um, and so really this is the first time this technique has been used here and was used as a pilot to see if this works see if this is something that may be viable for the future of our marshes um, at particular sites that could need it. So down at the bottom there are two pictures. The one on the left um, was taken with our aerial camera where uh, it was uh, almost immediately, maybe a month after the, um, the sediment was placed on the site. And you can see there, it's kind of a, a muddy, big muddy area. And then the picture on the right is uh, a picture just from two days ago of how it's bounced back. Um, this has taken some time and it's still kind of um, under monitoring right now to see if this is truly a, a success story or if this is in other places. Another way that we work with communities is with, um, with partners, U University of Georgia and a, a GMC, a contractor, we received National Fish and Wildlife Funding to create a Camden County Resiliency Implementation Work Plan with the county and all of its municipalities. The goal of the project was to create a plan for addressing all the various resiliency issues such as flooding by identifying nature-based solutions and therefore having a pipeline of priority projects with potential partners and funding that would help lead to their implement, ultimate implementation and success of the project. So that's ongoing now and should be done um, uh, come this May. This is the last project I'll highlight and then I'll wrap it up. Um, we've recently uh, received some funding from Georgia Sea Grant to help advance the science of coastal adaptation, like I mentioned earlier. And we're working with the University of Georgia on a project to assess the socioeconomic value of salt marsh ecosystems for clim potential climate resilience financing in Georgia. So this project is kicking off next month and will include modeling of the risk reduction value of our coastal marshes under various flooding and climate scenarios. We'll also engage um, a variety of state and regional stakeholders, including the insurance industry, which is kind of an innovative partner um, who's been involved with other projects based on coral reefs and mangrove systems about how can the, how can the insurance industry potentially play a part here in helping fund restoration or conservation of these ecosystems that help reduce risk on our coast. So that's all I have for y'all tonight. Here's three kind of takeaways um, to leave you with if, if you want to read through them. But, you know, just the highlights of, you know, I always tell people, know your flood risk of your properties, of where you're going, of your assets. Um, Clark highlighted a great uh, tool, Coastal Hazards Portal. SEMA and FEMA um, also have tools that can tell you your, not only your FEMA flood map information, but your future sea level rise information for your, your, um, your home, your properties. And so just to make sure that that you're building sustainably and resilience um, with resilience in mind and, um, and just knowledge is everything and data is everything there. The next one is just to support and advocate for local resiliency projects, plans, policies, efforts in your local community. That could be with your city council, your commissioners, even up at the state and federal level as well. This should be integrated into everything. And um, you know, certainly decision makers don't don't take those just don't take those uh, moves or steps unless their constituents support them. So please speak out on those and support those efforts. And then lastly, to keep up with all of this stuff, I know it can be overwhelming, but join a local conservation organization. They're certainly working on climate in some form or fashion, so support them. And that's it, thank you. All right, thank you so much um, to everyone. We have several questions that have come in and I've been writing down some questions as we go along. We're gonna have about 10 minutes for questions. So um, if everybody could be as to the point in their answers as possible, we'll, we'll get through them all. Um, <clears throat> uh, we'll start with this, that's kind of an overarching thing. And um, I, I've heard it before from lots of people, uh, Dave Kyler put it in the comments here, or the, the chat here as kind of a comment, but um, 
He's saying the urgency and importance of rapidly reducing the cause of climate change um, by curtailing the combustion of fossil fuel deserves top priority. Um, I think, uh, you know, if you, you, you could each comment on that briefly, I, I'm guessing that you would all agree with that, but it, um, maybe it's just a given at this point. And um, we're talking a little further down the line, but are, are there things that, um, you know, you think that we all should be doing to encourage the government or corporations to reduce the use of fossil fuels? Are you going to call on us one by one? Oh, oh sorry. Yeah, Clark, <laughs> you chimed in. Yeah, I better. Yeah. Um, well, from my perspective, you know, the, the, the data is there. Uh, we need to encourage our, our local and national leaders to encourage them to let them know that this is a top priority. We know that we need to take big action if we really want to make a difference because anything we're putting out there now is gonna be around for a long time. CO2 has a hundred year lifespan in the atmosphere. So if we don't start really curtailing things now, we're gonna be in really bad shape in the future. Kathy, you wanna chime in? Yes, thank you. Um, to me, it's a multi-pronged approach. Uh, we've gotta start uh, locally, we've got to start with our with ourselves, looking around us and and seeing where uh, what we can do on a in our households and just in our personal actions uh, to reduce our carbon footprint. Uh, and then it's got to go right on up the chain. And ending with what Clark is saying and, and what the League of Women Voters is saying is as to uh, elect <laughs> cue the kitty cat uh, elect. Um, officials that are uh, tuned in with how to mitigate climate change that we pass legislation that will reduce it. And just on another quick note, um, I'm very heartened by what I'm seeing. I, I teach a, a biomimicry class at Savannah College of Art and Design. Mm -hmm. And what we're, we're producing um, with sustainable, it's a, it's a program called Design for Sustainability. And that class has to, those students have to come up with projects. Everything has to be sustainable. And uh, in my class, it's all based on nature, but, but um, the future is with, with our young people that are coming, coming behind us. And we've got to put education out there that, uh, that points them in the right direction. Is yeah, something that I've been hearing about a lot lately is the, um, the balance between um, personal action and not wanting to shame people for their personal actions, it, you know, having that backfire, but then also what works on a, a larger scale um, and, and, you know, how you balance that. Yeah, I'll have to reiterate what Kathy said in terms of, um, changing our lifestyles, altering our lifestyles to meet the needs, the, the urgency of now, as Dr. Keene calls it. Uh, and that is, um, you know, from uh, um, the, the projects of Drawdown Georgia to Oceana's ban on offshore drilling and seismic testing, all of this stuff, as Kathy has said before, is interrelated. What I think about is, um, the changing composition of the ocean, ocean acidification, and um, how that impacts um, everything from uh, the foods that we eat, uh, uh, biodiversity, uh, as well as um, you know uh, the impact on on uh, fisheries. Um, local folks who rely on fishing. Um, they can't do it anymore. And so, you know, it's not just about um, um, uh, our, our elected officials, um, you know, uh, suggesting policy. It's also about educating our elected officials. You'd be surprised at the amount of uh, the number of elected officials who don't have a clue as to what climate change could possibly be. 
And these are folks that we vote on to, we voted on to uh, lead us into good policy. But I think um, it's, you know, you would think that it's common sense, but in my line of work, it's like, you know, um, how do you extract the stories or present the stories? Because people are compelled by, you know, lived experiences and um, these impactful stories to make uh, uh, some, to make the kind, kinds of changes uh, that will transform their lives, our lives, and uh, the lives of, uh, um, of future generations. Um, Bob, could you could you tell us about how um, you became an activist? I mean, how how you went from being an ex an Exxon worker to really um, lobbying against what they were doing. Well, I, I, we moved uh, we moved to Savannah in uh, 1995 and bought a home on the marsh, uh, looking out on over uh, the marsh of which comprises we are told 40 Georgia has 40 percent of saltwater marshes of all 15 states facing the Atlantic Ocean. And I, I, I had a hard time reconciling that with, with uh, what I learned uh, uh, from, uh, you know, the, the Skidaway Island uh, oceanographers who, who told me that they had done a survey and uh, with the amount of money they had to run it, clarified that the, the exposure was uh, 1,110 miles not 100 miles. And that made a lot of sense to me because when I look at out at that marsh and uh, living in the same home now for 23 years, we have lost six to eight feet of the natural vegetation beyond my back so-called lawn. And then there's a, <laughs> a margin of, of about eight feet of natural vegetation and that has shrunk by, by eight feet uh, over the years that we've been living in the house. And uh, it just bothered the heck out of me. And uh, so I got uh, hooked up with uh, Oceana uh, through uh, Paulita Bennett Martin. And she saw one of my letters to the editor, the first one. And uh, she wound up sending me to uh, Washington, D.C. on the same day that Mr. Trump was being, uh, uh, you know, ran into, into some trouble and, and was absolved mm -hmm. of any problems in that. But the fact is, uh, I, I, be, I know so much about what happens at the point of the spear in the petroleum industry, and we don't want our coast to look like the Gulf Coast 30 years from now. You know, we don't want that. We can't, we, we just, it, it's going to happen if, if we don't, uh, this plastic thing that, that's, I, I don't know what to do about it. Every week I take a 50 gallon, a 30 gallon sack of plastic that we managed to buy uh, food from in the last seven days. And the following week, I got the same amount of plastics to turn into the recycling place on Eisenhower Boulevard. And, uh, I know what's happening to that plastic. Damn near nothing. Pardon me. The amount of that plastic can be recycled. It's recycled into more plastic. It, it's, it's just scandalous. And, and uh, there's got to be some super, supermarkets that can, that can be brought to pressure by uh, consumers to quit buying that stuff that, that's wrapped in plastic or comes in sealed plastic containers. I, and I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to do that. And I don't know how we can lobby the retail um, community that, that sells that stuff. You know, how, how do they sell that stuff before plastic was invented? I think people survived in those days. days. How did they do it without buying stuff in plastic? I think you might have been one of the ones that survived, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, you know, I grew up uh, with, with Italian parents out in San Francisco, and we never saw a bit of plastic, but we, we, ate, we ate quite nicely, you know, and, and never, never dreamed that the Industrial Revolution 
gave us too much of a good thing. Mm -hmm. All, right. All right, thanks thanks for that, Bob. Um, Ash, Ashby, I'm wondering if you could tell us, talk a little bit about um, um, kind of what, what happens, um, you know, as, as the marsh starts to drown, you know, as sea level rises and, and the, the marsh gets taken over, what, what happens if it has no place to go? And yeah, you know, yeah, things don't right up to the, to the edge there. Yeah, so that is a big issue, particularly in locations where you have barriers for the marshes to not be able to migrate. Um, so as sea level is increasing, marshes are going to want to and need to migrate not only up the slope, but inland as well because of you know, just the salt and, and sea level rise. Um, so those ecosystems are going to be, um, as Robert just explained, going to be transitioning, you know, moving inland and upland. And so we need to leave spaces for these areas to be able to do that. Um, managing things like stormwater so it's not negatively impacting, you know, marsh health. Um, a lot, not making sure that invasive species are not taking over those areas where things are migrating and, and one habitat is turning into another. Um, and a big issue is uh, are things like infrastructure that can be in the way of that migration. It could be bulkheads that are in the way of that. It could be altered hydrology that doesn't allow those ecosystems to migrate naturally. These are all basically impediments to marsh migration. And that's a big concern and a big um, area of focus. It's certainly an area of focus of, uh, of Clark's work, um, research work with you know, how, are sea, how are marshes going to keep up with sea level rise and how is it you know, going to work here in Georgia. Um, and I'll kind of plug a, a project that several of us are, are either involved with or, or kind of know about, and that's um, an upcoming salt, salt marsh conservation plan for the Southeast uh, area. And that's being put on or put together when organized by Pew Charitable Trust. And that's ultimately to create a plan of how, how can we help these areas along the South Atlantic um, allow my marsh migration and what kind of actions need to happen to make that make that work so uh, so you know i know lots of you have been working in georgia on the coast for a long time and i wonder if you have experienced the way i have that after the um two hurricanes in 16 and 17 there was just a lot less doubt on the georgia coast um about sea level rise about climate change i mean i just didn't hear any pushback anymore i'm wondering if you all experienced the same thing i mean i hate to think that we needed to have a near disaster or a disaster in some cases to um make us realize and then you know i, I wonder if it's just coastal folks who felt that way or you know if it if it reached leaders in atlanta as well clark ha have you seen that change yeah, I, I, I want to validate that experience directly because I, I've, I've seen the same thing. I can't tell you how much more interest there has been in, in understanding climate change and particularly sea level rise. So I'm not sure that, that the impact and the, the understanding has reached the interior of the state because I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure that, that everyone appreciates the unique uh, situation that we're in here, well, not unique, really, but the different situation we're in, living in a very low-lying, intertidal, high tide range environment that is very low in relation to the water surface. Uh, I, I'm, yeah, so yes, I, I've seen the same thing, and I'm not sure the message has migrated as strongly the further you get from the coast. Ashby, have you seen that? Yeah, I was just going to chime in. So I, I've, I've had the exact same experience, of, especially right after the hurricanes, you know, a lot of interest and in, in taking action that were, you know, were good resiliency moves and investing dollars in some of those right places and looking at data and, and getting projects on the ground. I do, however, fear that the further we get from those events, the enthusiasm is starting to wane and other things become priority. Um, so I'm starting to see that as well. And I, you know, I think it's just has to be that constant drumbeat of, 
you know, we need to be doing this um, resiliency and, and adaptation and all of these things need to be um, in everything we do and considered in everything we do from development to policies to where we put people and, and, and job resiliency and, and all of those things. So, you know, it needs to be streamlined and, and very um, systemic. So I'm hoping that we we are moving in that direction. I hope that the motivation and the ball keeps rolling in that direction, but we'll see. That's that's our jobs, I guess, is to keep that going. Armina, you you used to work in Atlanta, so uh, do you see a different a difference after the last few few years here? Um, not really. I was at the state capitol um, last Wednesday, and again meeting with all our local state representatives and, um, and talking to folks, um, there is this clear delineation that the coast is like something separate from the inland and they don't, uh, many don't understand the realities of um, living this close to the ocean uh, and the impact of that. Um, so, um, as Ashby stated, there still needs to be some education around um, just what exactly is global warming, what is climate change, uh, as well as, you know, uh, ways of mitigating and adapting to it. Uh, but I want to take a, a, a stab at one of the questions uh, about greenhouse gases uh, that I see in the, um, in the, the chat. Um, Oceana is taking a firm stand on um, uh, addressing the sources of uh, greenhouse gas emissions and plastic pollution. Uh, on our federal level, we have a, a campaign um, that takes a look at um, the implications of Amazon and the enormous amount of um, carbon emissions and plastic that they are dumping into our environment, into our um, lifestyle as consumers, uh, especially under COVID. Uh, my granddaughter is screaming, so I apologize for that. Uh, especially under COVID when folks are home and they're ordering and ordering, uh, we're noticing that um, with Amazon, um, they should be taking a role in mitigating um, their greenhouse gas emissions, as well as um, being a source of an enormous amount of plastic pollution that is uh, invading our world. All right, we're gonna, we're gonna let Hermina have the last word there. Um, thank you to all of the panelists. Um, I appreciate all of you um, today and for the past 20 years. Um, Nina, do you wanna take over and say a few last words? We'll have the, um, the video up tomorrow or Saturday. And um, I'm imagining that we'll also have some uh, links to um, some, of the, some of the information that was mentioned so that if somebody wants to follow up, they can do so. Actually, um, I'm going to take over and say thank you. Um, I'm the program chair for the League of Women Voters Coastal Georgia. So I echo that thank you to our wonderful panelists. Our aim with our meetings is education. Um, and somebody just said that at the end that the more we can talk about this and the more we can get people to listen, um, we hope that we're doing our job through these meetings. Um, Mary, thank you. Uh, you are an expert and a subject matter extraordinaire, and we are very grateful that you were willing to moderate this for us, along with our fabulous panelists. It's been wonderful to get to know you. Um, as you say, um, if our technology guru uh, can manage it, he, Seth Golby is wonderful, and he will turn this into a YouTube video which we hope we will have up on the League of Women Voters Coastal Georgia website by tomorrow, uh, late in the afternoon. Um, so look for that. And we will certainly send it to everybody who registered for today. Um, and finally, I want to say that on February 14th, the League of Women Voters 
will be 102 years old. And we here in uh, coastal Georgia are always um, anxious to have more members. So if you have joined us tonight and are not a member, please go to our website. Um, we know it says the League of Women Voters. We can't change that after 102 years, but we actually do welcome men to belong as well. So thank you again. Um, and hopefully um, I can tell you definitely that in March, our meeting will be um, focusing on healthcare. Um, and we have an inc uh, a pretty exciting group of people to talk about some of the things that are going on in Georgia that quite honestly, we can't be very proud of. And we've got a lot of work to do, just like we've have a lot of work to do uh, with climate change and coastal conservation. So thank you and good night. You have all been wonderful.